The blizzard hits harder than any warning Dimitro has ever heard. One moment he's leading his herd across the Carpathian high pastures. The next, the entire mountain disappears. The sky goes white, the wind turns violent, and every path home is swallowed by snow. At 34, Dimitro knows one truth his ancestors carved into memory. When the mountain erases the world, you don't run. You build, not a tarp, not a lean-to. A shelter engineered by centuries of survival, the Kaliba. Low to the ground, set into the slope, built with log walls sealed by dry moss, and a turf roof heavy enough to fight the storm itself. Most people today wouldn't last an hour out here. Dimitro has one night to prove he still can, and whether he survives depends on how fast he can rebuild what archaeology tells us his people perfected 600 years ago. The storm doesn't give Dimitro time to think, but it does give him one chance. Build the foundation right, or freeze before he even strikes a spark. He studies the slope the way his father once did, turning his face into the wind, feeling where it breaks, where it curls, where it dies. The Carpathians teach quietly, but their lessons are sharp. And tonight, he needs every one of them. Archaeologists who dug through old Kaliba sites in the Tatra Mountains and in Maramurish found something almost every shelter shared a floor set lower than the ground 20 to 60 centimeters deep and a ring of packed earth forming a natural wind berm. Even the post holes sit low, marking the outline of a shelter built close to the earth, a low profile design meant to survive storms exactly like this. Dimitro knows this without reading a single book. It's in his hands, in his memory, in the way the mountain looks when a blizzard is about to break. He grips his wooden shovel, not to steady himself, but to remind himself he still has work to do. He clears a patch of snow, revealing the dark soil beneath. Then he begins to dig, slow, steady strokes. No panic, no wasted energy. The kind of rhythm a man finds only after years herding across high pastures and learning the patience of the mountains. Within minutes, he's carved out a shallow basin, a low thermal pocket, where heat will settle instead of fleeing. He scoops the loosened earth and piles it along the edges, shaping a berm that rises like a quiet shield. Wind hits it, splits, lifts, and passes over. This is exactly what modern survival experts still teach. Lower the shelter, and the wind can't tear it apart. Lower the floor, and the cold can't steal every degree of warmth. In fact, studies show that ground-level microclimates can significantly reduce heat loss, often on the order of a few dozen percent, something the old Carpathians understood centuries before the science existed. Dimitro pauses just long enough to check his work. The basin is clean, the berm stands firm, and the storm raging harder now hesitates for a moment, as if deciding whether to test him further. He narrows his eyes. He knows the truth his ancestors lived by. If the foundation isn't low enough, the rest of the shelter won't matter. The wind will rip the walls apart, the cold will seep under the logs, and he'll be dead before he can coax a flame to life. But not tonight. He has built the ground. Now he can build the home. The wind keeps climbing the ridge behind him, dragging long waves of snow through the pines. Dimitro doesn't look back. He knows the foundation will hold. Now he needs walls strong enough to keep the storm from swallowing his heat hole. Archaeologists studying old Kaliba ruins in the Carpathians notice the same thing again and again. Tool marks shaped like shallow arcs, the signature of a hand axe. Joint cuts angled into the wood saddle notches that lock two logs together without a single nail. And tiny traces of organic insulation caught in the stratigraphy. Moss pressed deep into the seams. A material so simple you'd walk past it without a second thought. Yet it insulated medieval huts from Romania to Slovakia for centuries. Dimitro steps into the tree line and finds a spruce with a straight, obedient trunk. He grips his axe, one breath, then he cuts. 
Not with panic, not with speed, but with the quiet determination of someone who has lived long enough to know that rushing gets a man killed faster than the cold. The tree falls with a muted thud, swallowed by the heavy silence drifting through the forest. He trims it, splits it, and sets the first log across the low foundation, another log, then the next, each one turned and seated into place. The saddle notch grabs the wood, the way two bones fit into a joint, a self-locking frame perfected somewhere between the 14th and 19th centuries, and still unbeaten in storms like this. He doesn't need nails, he doesn't need rope, he just needs the notch to bite. When the walls stand shoulder high, Dimitro kneels and collects handfuls of dry moss from beneath a fallen tree. It crumbles softly between his gloves, light as dust, but packed with tiny air pockets, nature's foam insulation, long before science had a name for it. He pushes it into every seam, every gap, every place the wind might sneak through. The log walls thicken. The shelter begins to breathe like a living thing. Modern tests on moss-packed cabins show heat retention nearly equal to small timber huts. Proof that the old ways weren't guesswork, but engineering shaped by survival. Outside, the wind slams harder against the ridge. Snow rattles through the branches like bones. Dimitro places his palm against the new wall. No cold bleeding through. No whisper of wind. Just the steady warmth of wood doing exactly what it's meant to do. The foundation is set. The walls are sure. And he knows what comes next is the hardest part of all, building a roof that can stand against the night. The walls are holding, but Dimitro knows the truth. Every Carpathian herder learns before he grows old. A shelter without a proper roof is just an invitation for the storm to finish what it started. Up here, the wind doesn't argue. It decides. And if the roof isn't built the right way, it will peel it off like bark from a branch. Archaeologists working in Vulcalinic, the Hutzul Highlands, and the Romanian valleys of Maramurish kept finding the same evidence across centuries of Koliba, remains thick turf layers, usually 30 to 40 centimeters, laid over birch bark that still clung to the decayed beams beneath. A system so consistent, so deliberate, that it could only have been refined through long, ruthless winters. Birch bark to keep the water out, turf to keep the heat in, and wait a lot of it to pin the roof to the earth when the mountain tried to tear it away. Demetro remembers his father showing him the method on a calmer day years ago. Build the roof like you're arguing with the wind, he'd said, and make sure you win. Now, standing in a storm that feels personal, Dimitro sets to work. He lays the birch bark first, wide strips flexible but tough overlapping until they form a skin that sheds water before it can seep into the wood. He presses each section down with the heel of his palm, ensuring no corner curls upward because a single lifted edge can grow into a rip large enough for the wind to crawl under. Then he moves to the turf. He cuts into the frozen pasture with the familiarity of a man who has done this many seasons before storms like this one. Turf isn't just dirt and grass, it's a woven mat of root soil and moisture, a natural composite material that acts as both armor and insulation. He lifts each slab carefully, keeping the roots intact and carries it to the roof. One block, then another, then another. The roof grows heavier, denser, stronger. He stacks the turf with intention overlapping the edges so the wind can't find a seam to pry open. And when the final layer is in place, he gathers a handful of small stones rounded by rivers heavy enough to matter and sets them along the top ridge. Not for show, for survival. Science would later confirm what tradition had already perfected. Turf is a super insulator. Its trapped air pockets slow heat loss better than many modern materials. Snow falling on it doesn't chill the shelter, it thickens the insulation. Vertical heat loss can drop dramatically sometimes by as much as half once the snow settles. Dimitro doesn't know the numbers. He doesn't need to. He knows the signs. As the first gust slams into the Kaliba, the turf doesn't shift, not even a tremble. Then the sound comes a deep, soft whoomp, whoomp, as fresh snow lands on the roof and settles into place. 
It's the sound of a shelter sealing itself the moment a Kaliba stops being a pile of logs and starts becoming a refuge. Dimitro exhales. The hardest part is still ahead. But for the first time tonight, the mountain feels just a little less angry. The roof is holding. The walls are tight. But without fire, none of it matters. A shelter without heat is just a slower way to die. Archaeologists studying Kaliba foundations across the Carpathians found something that surprised even them. A small hearth set in the corner, its base made of river stones. No chimney, no smoke channel, nothing that resembles the fireplaces of later centuries. And thick layers of ash and char built up over years, proof that these huts burn day after day, season after season without filling the room with deadly smoke. The secret wasn't a missing chimney, it was the turf roof. Dimitro gathers a few stones from the edge of the tree-lined flat ones, the kind his father always said, don't crack under heat. He sets them into a tight semicircle, building a cradle for a fire no bigger than his two hands. In a storm like this, big fires kill more men than they save. Heat escapes too fast, smoke smothers too quick, small and steady wins the night. He reaches for spruce. Not because it's plentiful though it is, but because spruce smokes less than beech or fir when burned slow. That means clearer air, a safer draft, and less soot clinging to the roof beams. He lights the tinder with a practiced patience. No panic, no wasted motion. The flame crawls upward, tasting the resin in the wood, then settles into a low orange glow, the kind of fire a mountain man trusts. And then the magic happens. The smoke rises, but instead of choking the room, it slips into the turf. The warm smoke helps dry the roof from within, hardening it over time and cutting down the moisture that can make huts sag or rot under wet snow. Modern researchers would later call this a natural draft system. For Dimitro, it's simply the way it's always been done. Heat rolls out from the corner, spreading along the log walls. The warmth sinks into the wood, then radiates back, creating a small microclimate inside the Kaliba, a pocket of life in a night designed to kill. Outside, the blizzard grows angrier. The wind slams into the roof. Snow lashes the walls like claws. But inside, Dimitro watches the smoke disappear into the ceiling, as if the mountain itself is breathing with him. If the roof didn't draw the smoke, he'd already be choking. If the stones cracked, the fire would fail. If the hearth the wasn't in the corner, the heat wouldn't spread. But everything is working, exactly as his ancestors intended. He closes his eyes for a moment. The fire is alive. And now, so is he. Morning doesn't arrive with sunshine. It arrives with silence. The wind has finally run out of anger. Snow lies heavy on the Kaliba, but the little hut is still there, low, rough, stubborn. And Mitro steps out of it alive. From the outside, it looks like nothing. A low-profile shelter tucked into the slope. Log walls packed with moss. A thick turf roof still holding last night's snow. A corner hearth, now gone to embers. One small door that kept the warmth and the man inside. But when you look closer, you see something else. This isn't just a hut thrown together in a panic. It's minimalist architecture pushed all the way to perfection. A foundation dug low. Wind berms. Self-locking, saddle-notched logs. Organic insulation. Natural draft through the roof. The same details archaeologists uncover in ruins today. Dimitro just used to make it to sunrise 600 years ago. The Carpathian people didn't just live in nature, they decoded it. And they left behind one of the most efficient survival shelters humans have ever built.